Booster 11 just static fired like crazy just a short time after Flight 3. We got some cool Polaris Dawn news, and it's almost eclipse time. Roll the intro. And here we go. Chamber pressure looks good. Following up. All right, you know the drill. It's another week over and another NSF Live. So we have a lot to talk about. I mean, Booster 11 literally just static fired. So let's get right into it. I'm Jack Byer for NSF. Uh, we were just live for several hours. So watch that stream after this if you have not already. Um, but let's look at some cool replays of it and, and chat about what we saw and also all the other cool news this week. Um, but joining me, of course, is Adrian. Adrian, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I mean, I'm looking forward to talk some some booster static here. Uh, quite quite nicely timed with uh, how SpaceX lined that up. So yeah, thanks SpaceX for not crushing the NSF lifetime, but getting in time so we can also have this show. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, there's also been the uh, the chaos associated with the eclipse, and there was an alternate closure date on Monday. <laughs> so I think we're all glad <laughs> that the static fire happened today, uh, but we'll talk about that more in a second. Also joining us is Sawyer. Sawyer, how you doing, bud? Looking fresh as always. Good. Well, thank you. Yeah, I actually just got the hairs cut today just for this. Nice. Well, for a couple reasons, but wanted to look good on air with it. But it's uh, good to be back. And EJ, you look a lot different. Uh, I do want to hear, I said this earlier in the week, Adrian, I want to try and hear you do a Boston accent at some point tonight. Oh my god, I, I, I will not even I will not even try, but we should probably note at this point that uh, EJ is not available this week. Uh and so uh we got a German to jump in there. So uh that that's what you're stuck with. I want to hear you say pack the car and have it yad. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all we were gonna get, unfortunately. Yeah. But what we <laughs> what we did get today is of course the booster static fire. How do you like that segue? Isn't that great? That was smooth. Um, but yeah, what do we? I was I was on stream with uh, with Trevor and Ryan. You guys were hanging out in the back channel. But I mean, in your own words, how do how does this sec static fire happening so close after the last flight uh, make you feel? Adrian, I'll let you go first. Yeah, I. Uh... I honestly, in a weird way, I'm surprised and not surprised about the pace. I feel like we all saw it coming, how they would start to ramp this up. I didn't think it would happen so quickly. Uh, maybe. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a, you always say, oh, it's going to be faster, right? But then it actually goes faster and faster, and you're like, oh, wow, they are really going for this. Uh, so, yeah, quite impressive. I mean, we are now three weeks and some days after the flight. And we have both stages static fired for the next flight. That's uh, that's bonkers. Uh, of course, we are still standing by wait, uh, waiting for like final confirmation how test today went. But I think on preliminary, uh, like looking at it and like the good old uh, booster still standing check, uh, I would say <laughs> looks pretty good. Um, so yeah, yeah let's. Uh, Let's let's see how the final review here is, but I mean it's impressive. We we are we 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 are not that far away from saying, oh, by the way, this booster's like this this flight is ready. It's kind of crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Sawyer, thoughts? 
my thoughts is, you know, you hear all these dates of like, oh, it's going to be coming up soon. You know, Elon saying now next month, so meaning May. And it's like, yeah, all right. They, well, they still have to static fire the ship. They did that. Well, then they still have to static fire the booster. They did that. Now it's like, oh, okay, this is pace. This is picking up the pace. The dates seem a lot more realistic, especially after this. It's like, whoa, okay. It's already been static fired. That is a huge major step already out of the way. And now comes the next question of how many times will Booster 11 stack and destack from the OLS? The crazy thing is, uh, if I chime in here again, um, we, we just had a turnaround of this pad of about three weeks, right? From, like, f uh, from flight to firing again. Name more rockets that had a three-week turnaround on their pad. Like, name, it's, it's, of course, Falcon. Like, yes, Falcon 9. But once you're past Falcon 9, three-week turnaround is kind of... It's, it's, it's already impressive. And we are talking about the biggest rocket of all time here. Um, and it, it, it's kind of insane that it's already approaching situations where we are like, oh, this is, this is fast for a turnaround. This is approaching really fast territory for every rocket that is not called Falcon 9. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I, we could, it... we could activate fight mode, but I, you're not wrong. So I'm not going to fight you. Sorry, Sawyer, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I was going to say, Shuttle at its fastest in, you know, 1985, even still, was averaging about one a month. And they also had 39A, well, most of those were 39A, actually. Uh, Challenger in January of 86 was the first flight out of 39B. But so that pad was probably close with 39A with Shuttle, the closest we've seen. But this is getting crazy now. Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. I think so often with um, different space flight projects i mean the shuttle was delayed a lot like a lot of times things take longer than you would hope that they take and in this case uh, yes of course faster even faster somehow would be way better but I don't, I don't think you can really ask this program to go much faster than it is right now and it's it's just so great to see um while we continue to watch replays i do want to remind chat that we uh will answer your questions so if you have any questions type at nasa space flight into chat and we'll see it pop up in some software that we have running in the background if my iPad will cooperate. <laughs> and it looks like it is. Hooray. Also, Jerwa, tried and true, good old Jerwa, thank you so much for gifting 10 Red Team memberships. Super appreciate that. And if you got one from Jerwa, be sure to thank them. So yeah, I mean, static fire, right? It looked really clean. Didn't seem like there was any holds in the count based on um, tank farm activity and the flow of the OLM um, plumbing and all of that, you know, that we've been able to track. I say we, it's like you and Alex, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a, a true statement here. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally uh, conceding and like no longer like I would I like it's unfair to Alex to even say that I am no longer here. Alex is at this point the master of predicting timings for this. And um, yes, I did it in the past. I I no longer really tracking like every single timing. That's Alex now, and Alex has been an absolute master of getting down to like half a minute, like a minute of tracking this. So yeah, I, I full praise to Alex, completely insane work. On the, on the one hand, um, I love it. On the other hand, um, it almost takes some of the fun out of it. It's like, there should <laughs> almost be like a spoiler warning, <laughs> like spoiler, Alex already knows when it's going to happen. So if you, if you don't want to know, if you want to be surprised, <laughs> mute, mute the audio for five seconds or something. Although um, <laughs> he was slacking. Alex was slacking a bit today. His timing for the static fire was off by 19 seconds. Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, uh, 19 seconds. Jeez. <laughs> Alex, do, you're even trying. Over yeah, there. do better. <laughs> <laughs> so, booster static fired. We talked about ship twenty nine static fired and was rolled back. Um, some other, a lot of other stuff has been going on in Starbase. Um, they moved ship thirty one into the me new mega bay, so they cleared some way in the high bay for Starship version two. Maybe question mark. We were talking about this on the on the static fire stream. Ryan kind of thought that uh, 
the high bay is not long for this world. <laughs> Put it that way. Like the highway, be, high bay would be demolished and replaced with a mega bay. Um, I don't know. What do you like? What do you guys think? I'll, we'll go with Sawyer first. Like, do you think we might see some V2 hardware rolled out and into the high bay, or do you think it's kind of kaput? I wonder if maybe they start stacking or start testing the practices of how they're going to do it with the V2 inside first. And then, you know, they have the equipment there, they have the kind of concept of what they're going to do. So maybe after that is when they'll go, all right, now we know what we need, we know what has to be done, let's demolish this and make one that's already set for V2. Yeah, it could be. I mean, that would, that would in a lot of ways make sense. And then if they get to V3 eventually and, and stretch the ship, and it, you know, they don't have to worry about size constraints with the high bay. Um, Adrian, what do you, what are your what are your thoughts? I think so. I I fully agree. The high base times or days are limited at this point, especially if with another ship stretch is coming. There's just a like a limit of like usability and limitation probably. Um, that that will just happen at some point. Um, and uh, yeah, I. I I honestly think that that we're approaching at least a somehow low overhaul on that side of the factory. I mean, we already saw it. I think you could call it kind of called Star Factory the beginning of getting the ring and production area ready for V2. It's kind of like, okay, let's let's really build a facility that that will basically fully kick into gear probably with V2. Um, and then at some point, maybe this the stacking area will kind of follow the scheme and we'll see one more mega bay probably um so we will have like three three mega bays and then like the star factory i mean we already know that inside of this complex there are some v2 parts there are some ring stacks that are looking a bit off there are some uh so, some other things that are definitely indicating and also we know from just from the amount of usual uh forward time they have on ships and boosters they are v2 parts in progress they are already starting to to get into the flow here um it's just a matter of how long will there be a gap maybe in stacking operations but i wouldn't be surprised if there might be a sort stop in st stacking operations at some point but they will just have like one two ships produced like two parts right behind it and then, like, as soon as a new stacking area is ready or, like, they are ready to stack a V2, they just roll out every single part and, like, stack it in very quick succession because, well, the sections are already prepared at that point, probably. So, um, yeah, uh, it's it's quite interesting. Like, this, these overhaul times, I think, are always the, the most spicy and interesting, interesting, uh, interesting parts in Starbase. So, uh, totally interested to, to see how V2 looks like. I mean... That's going to be exciting. Yeah, absolutely. It, these really are the most interesting times because there's so many questions we have and so many so many new things with Starship that are going to happen, like different catch points on the ship, to name a really minor example, or maybe different flap placement or sizing, if that ever actually happens, or even just an HLS ship. Like There are times when you really get to see little bit more of the future here and there and we're hopefully we're getting into that because and i do see i saw a couple of people in chat asking what v2 what are we talking about we're talking about the next version of starship um is basically what we're talking about and it's you know there's been a little bit of dis, like bits of details here and there about what it could in, it incorporate into its design but we don't we don't fully know really until we see it what um you know everything that they're going to have done Hey, the chopsticks are moving, and this is live. And green, nonetheless, for those who are colorblind. I like it. It makes me feel like I'm using a 1990s camcorder. <laughs> we need like well, the like, we need the, the safe dot. area. We need the safe area lines. Uh, what what Adrian? We need a red dot that is like yeah. flashing yeah. every two seconds. Like, yeah. yep, this is really live. <laughs> So I guess now with this one, it looks like they're just kind of lowering them, not really to grab the booster again, just to kind of lower them down the tower there. Yeah, I'm sort of wondering what's what's going to play out here. Are they just moving them out of the launch position, or are they going to get ready and and lift the booster, or maybe just hug the booster? Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But they did. Uh, what was the the new closure that was posted? There was a intermittent delay closure, like a movement closure. Was 10, that for for 10 the seventh? 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. on the 7th. So, on the 7th. Uh, 
seven to eight basically um i wouldn't be surprised if that's booster um we'll we'll, uh we'll see what what will happen in the end but um I, I, I would imagine at this point what we could see is them going for quick inspections on this, like checking out, hey, are we fine with the static fire? Um, somebody puts like a flashlight on every single raptor and it's like, check, um, like stuff like that. And uh, then they remove this booster because this booster is not flight ready yet. They're, they're, it's it's missing, missing one single component, for example, which is the hot staging ring, uh, which uh, I, I would expect at this point, as we have seen that with last flights, uh, one final rollback, like a final flight integration rollback almost, and then they are getting like ready to like fully, fully get both things out. We see that right now with Shift Twenty Nine, where they started to tear off some of the tiles, right. where they are probably uh, doing some final inspections and checkouts, and also work to prepare it for flight flight integration. Right, a lot more tiles off of Ship 29 than I sort of expected. I mean, based on nothing, but uh, when they when they did do that shuffle, it was it was pretty uh, pretty significant how many tiles they pulled off. Sawyer, what are you what are you doing right now? It's the moon train's back. The, what? You not hear the train horn? Oh no, no? I don't. Oh, come on. It's, it's, it's the usual bright line moon train coming through right during uh, NSF Live. It's, it's tradition at this point, so I figure yeah. I might as well do a little choo-choo as it goes by. I'm sad I didn't hear this. I think this is the first week I haven't heard it. Um, I don't know. Maybe, I'm, maybe I just need to turn my audio up, but uh, yeah. thank you. Thanks, thanks for the second explanation. One, second one this stream already, which wow. thank you, bright line. Thank you. Right. Do, do, you want, do you guys want to see a magic trick? I have a magic you trick. Oh my god, what? Uh oh. Yes. So, watch, I can equally make everybody in chat excited and all producers at NSF nervous at the same time. We might just be one test away from Flight 4 readiness. See? Works. I'm, everybody I'm, now is excited because it's just one more test, and Kevin <laughs> probably is very nervous. I'm Excuse also me? excited, and I'm also nervous. Um, but I'm also excited. No. I don't know. I, I don't get quite as nervous for the, the flights. I mean, flight flight three for me was relatively. I mean, I was nervous, but not nothing compared to flight two, and nothing compared to flight one. Uh, so as they do these more and more, I mean, you're definitely right, Adrian. <laughs> but hopefully, uh, we get a little bit more comfortable because a starship, a starship launch. I mean, you, we go all out. How could you not? What do you think that final test would be? By the way, do you think they would do a wet dress or kind of just? go for it now at this point and use a launch attempt as a wet dress um i think we will see another wet dress i i i'm i'm not, i'm not there like i feel like once they are really nailing down this whole profile and like once they are really into a situation that they are like confident with this whole flow i think they will stop at some points doing some of these tests because then it's moving into operational mode right then you have payloads you also have to care for uh, yada yada um however i do not think right now like they have to do a lot of other homework before they can fly anyway so i do not think like putting a wet dress in there will slow them down that much from what we can tell there's still some regulatory work they have to complete uh we have not heard from neither the spacex or the faa yet that the uh spacex led mishap investigation is in any way like turned in or like the checklist is already there which means I, I feel like at least safe that's not going to happen like in the next two to three weeks, uh, the flight. Um, so, I mean, they could totally complete a wet dress rehearsal in like the next two, three weeks. That's, I, I don't think that's unrealistic. Uh, and uh, I don't think regulatory readiness will be happening in the next two, three weeks because, again, SpaceX has to do this full mishap investigation. They have to put a list at the FAA's, like... Uh, office kind of and say like hey these are the uh mitigated items we have identified that we want to improve on and then the faa has to check that off uh and also thanks for that Carson. i just saw that uh and also elon musk has confirmed flight next month so it's not gonna they have time guys i'm sorry yeah. we're gonna have to end and end, end, end nsf live early oh. what i have to go get ready for the next flight <laughs> okay yeah i know that makes sense Bye. Yeah, that makes sense. Bye. Later. Bye, Kevin. Chat, say bye to Kevin.
Um, we have some really good questions coming in. Uh, Demian is asking, do you think Booster 12 and Ship 30 will static fire before Flight 4? What do you think, Adrian? Oh, Sawyer, I guessed wrong. <laughs> Hi, it's, it's me. Uh, I mean, they're making really good progress. I don't think they're going to, though, personally. I think right now the focus is this rapid turnaround between these two flights here, kind of, in a way, proving, like, look, you know, we are getting it down from six months to four months to two to three months and so on. I mean, yeah, that might expedite it, but I think right now the main focus in terms of actual firing is 29 and 11. I, I agree. Like, I, I don't think if there's, like, they would never put the next flight in the, in the critical path of this flight. Like, they would, they would not stop the train to stay at the train uh, theme. Um, but I think there could be a potential where they just have time to squeeze in a ship 30 static fire. Uh, booster is super unlikely because the booster would need the orbital launch mount. And I think the orbital launch mount will be occupied by this booster very a lot of times. And especially for final checkouts before wet dress rehearsal, you have the full stack there. So booster is super unlikely, I think. Um, ship, I think, is possible that they will try to get some testing in there a uh, static fire maybe even like close out the ship oh my god that shot is so insane yep doesn't get old oh my why, god why are you why are you not standing there jack and taking that shot <laughs> i would give me like a, like a diving bell like the old timey diving suits but like one that can survive a, a rocket launch i'd stand right there baby i'd become a pile of jelly but I, <laughs> but I, I mean, what a way to go! Uh, I, I'm looking forward to the f f close to flight interviews. I'm like, and now we're going to Jack, who's standing next to the orbital launch mount, oh, and geez. you see like the deluge going behind Jack. There's like, just like camera. a there's just like a red mist in the air, and it's like, uh. <laughs> it's so um, You've seen the old the old ones though, of like the early launches at the Cape. I mean, they the media was feet away hundreds of feet away as opposed to miles away they were just like oh we'll put you on this hill over here and there's a rocket just right in front of you and good luck that's amazing i mean have you have you seen that that one sh the like the 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 brick wall in i think it's Xi, it's xishang in china where the the long marches launch out of this valley and there's like oh, a brick yeah. wall where you have like tourists regularly sitting and it's like 300 meters away from the pads. Yeah. Goals. And yet it's not I them wanna... that it lands on. Oof. <laughs> but, but true, but oof. Um, goals. I, I really want to see some launches uh, out of China and Russia someday. It's like a huge goal of mine eventually. It'd be really cool. What's your like? And Japan for that matter. What's your like goal uh, launch to watch outside of the United States? Like, if you, I'm ex excluding United States launches here because I feel like everybody's quickly doing something like Starship or Falcon Heavy. So, if you have to pick like one rocket you can see launch that is not launching from the United States, which would it be? Sawyer, if you have one, immediately go for it. This is like a this is a hard question. I'm I know. trying to think. There's so many beautiful rockets um that outside of the u.s like you get crazy propellants you get hyper galls you get insane orange mock diamonds like i just there there are some really really interesting things to photograph like i immediately think of soyuz yeah um i i'm not up on on the chinese rockets as much as i absolutely should be but like one of the long marches with the uh with the solid strap-ons and the, and the and the liquid center core long march like, five yeah, that would be amazing. Well, and Walmart. of course, I want to see oh. um, H3 really bad. I really want to oh, see yes. H3 oh. launch out of Ten Tenegashima, especially since we're coming up on the last launch of Delta IV Heavy and the last launch of the Deltas. H3 is like the weird, not weird, but like cousin to, to, to Delta. So that'll be like one more, you know, the last vestiges or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's a really good question, Adrian. Sawyer, anything, uh, anything I missed or that you would that you would prioritize? The only other one that seems like it would be a 
cool to watch, not necessarily because of the rocket, but just because of the experience would be um, PSLV. Yeah. It's just that would be really cool. When you see all the people gathered in the crowds, it it just feels like such a fun atmosphere there. I would I would do it for the atmosphere more so than the rocket, but still. I just I think about the different images that you can create because you know a lot of times we there's so many launches out of the cape and like that's sort of the image in your mind of a launch site and of launch imagery that you form to a large extent um and it's it's just so interesting to see imagery from different pads around the world and think about the different types of images you could create like just a massive crowd of people uh watching a rocket launch from like their homes or something would be really cool like yeah all kinds of um really really cool stuff that's a good question adrian Eric. Thank you. I, I, my, my twos are um, for historic reasons, Baikonur. I, I would love to see something from Baikonur. I think it's just like, I mean, they, they have, it, it's hard to find, uh, like, it's probably top three most historic space right. uh, ports in the world. I, I, right. I would love to see Baikonur. Uh, and the other one is the ones that operational, the Andoya spaceport in Norway. Because I, I, I'm not sure if we can show this, but I posted a picture for you two in the back channel, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Oh my god! Yeah, wow. that yeah, is it's like, stunning. It's is that picturesque? Is that or... No, apparently that's a like the that's the picture of them building the pads. Wow. Yeah, I mean that, that's like Mahia levels of beautiful. Like, of course, Electron would be on the list as well because they launch out of New Zealand. But you can also see an Electron out of Wallops. So I, I, I don't say. know. I, that's not where my mind went immediately. Not to, I'm not like trying to shade Electron or anything. Me like Electron. Electron good. I was going to say, yes, uh, it wasn't uh, also launching in Virginia. Also, very small set. So that'd I, be cool. I like the feeling of the big boys. Yeah, true. Um, do they still, is Proton still a thing? I would definitely love to see Proton. That is another one with just absolutely gorgeous exhaust. There's, there, there's by the way, that's Andoya. Oh, like, wow. Beautiful. I mean, that's, that's that's gorgeous. That's not a render. No, apparently I'm not sure. I'm trying to verify right now. It looks like that one. Shed, it looks too nice. The shed on the left really looks like a render. But either way, when they, whenever this becomes operational, I'm sure a pad here is going to be absolutely beautiful. Kind of like Cody. I have a hard a time saying this is a render. Like there's there are things on it that I don't think would be on a render. It's a really nice photo. So yeah, that's like, why I'm that's why I'm skeptical. <laughs> I I've seen photos of it that look the same, like like okay. in winter. So I I I'm pretty sure this is like uh like it looks like this. Nice, super cool. Well, that was fun. That was a yeah. I'm, like now my mind is just thinking about all. Wow, good question. <laughs> so uh, Starship, is there anything we want to hit? Inter oh, I know something we want to hit. It's what SpaceX did, which was hit all of the legs at the orbital launch mount at KSC and knock them all down. Ha ha! Segways. Look, 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 there's a sad Florida person below me. <laughs> when Sawyer <laughs> thinks it's bad, you know it's really bad. Um, but yeah, what the heck do we think is going on here? Sawyer, you just edited a flyover that we, uh, that we put out where we talked about this very thing. So lay it on us. I... I... <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't get over the phrase, there's a sad Sawyer below me. That just, I, I don't know why that's so funny to me. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, not only did they knock down the legs where they were going to put the orbital launch mount there, they knocked it down fast. I mean, it, it was like, it seemed like only a week. Especially the fact that when we flew, two of them were standing, then one of them came down, and then literally as we were getting ready to publish, they all of a sudden went, hey, by the way, guess what? They're all gone now. So we had to quickly throw that in there, too, of even since then, it's changed. So it's, I mean, Alex lays out some really good points in there of the potential of, you know, what they could be doing with it. Could it be a redesign? Uh, could it be they're scrapping hey, it entirely? Things like that. It's, I, I'm interested to see what they end up doing there. Uh, I have a feeling that at some point we will see a new orbital launch mount. I don't think they're going to completely crash the whole program there, but I think there's definitely going to be some redesigns, especially since we know that the uh, OLM ring is sitting outside Hangar M thanks to that uh, imagery 
that Harry was able to get using those SAR cameras, so, or the SAR satellites. Nice. We gotta love good old Harry Stranger. Hi, Harry. You're the best. Yeah, shout out to Harry. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting development, to say the least. Uh, I, there it is. Be sure to check out the KSC flyover where we go over it in, uh, in detail, but Definitely interesting to see, and it, it would just make sense that based on what SpaceX has learned from the first three flights uh, with the orbital launch mount and the orbital launch pad here in Starbase, that they would um, perhaps change their change their plans a bit. And who knows, maybe the two, aren't, the two things aren't connected at all, but either way, clearly, there's going to be a change of the pad, if not just new legs that are better in some way. I have no idea. I think, Adrian, I, you, I think you have thoughts. I think there's a good chance that Boca will help us get a better picture because I think right now the most likely second pad we will see is possibly Boca with them like really committing now to this the second tower there. So if the OLM there suddenly has I don't know four four legs or something, like we know why this happened. I think that's that's our big investigation clue here that we will get if the if that design has changed, then we see why. Florida has changed. Um, but that's that's just not there yet. We are not just there yet, but I think I think in three to six months from now we will have a way better understanding of why this happened. Yeah. Good call. Um, let's do some questions. I feel like we need a sound effect for question time. I'm sure Kevin's got something. I know that's why I say these things out loud, Sawyers, because it's just no, the no, outro. No, 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 that's the play no, yeah, out music. No. It needs to be like a sting, like a, uh, like a, I don't know. I, I need, there needs to be a, uh, wait, yes. do that again? Yeah. All right, it's question time. It's the question All time the question train. It's the question train. <laughs> because this show is never on rails, let's hop on the question train. <laughs> Sawyer saved it. Way to go, Sawyer. Uh, By the way, guys, uh, Andy I have some is breaking asking, news. What's the breaking news, Kevin? We just got a clip from Mary from today's Static Fire. Do we want to look at it or maybe wait till? Yes, later? it's up to you. No, I, well, let's do questions after we we look at it. Let's look at it. Yes. I want to see this. I, right. I like more clips. I like more clips. This too, is an angle so. that we have not seen yet from Mary. Here we go. I like when Kevin has breaking news. Oh, this is great. Wait for it. Beautiful. There's no better sound in the world. Oh. Mary that captured crackle. It so well. And and the ignition, it almost sounded like a clap of thunder. Like that was uh, wow. Oh Oof. wow. Unbelievable audio. I, uh, based on the light reflection in the cloud, I, I still think it's like roughly six and a half seconds. Uh, like you could see in the plume, there's like one spot where it really reflects the uh, the engine. Um, and I think it's roughly six and a half ignition, um, which tracks with what we would expect for a full duration static fire. So I, I remind with my opinion that this was a good static fire. I'm just. I can we yeah. Can we hear it again? I I just want to hear it again. Please. I don't even have anything. I have nothing smart to say. I just want to hear it and see it again. I can talk about it before the sound hits. So. Yes, go. I'm just gonna. So you can be see in the cloud job. here. One, two, three, four, five, six, and shut down. Excellent. Why do I feel like that's what the people in the Northeast were thinking when the earthquake hit today? <laughs> what is this crazy six and a half second rumble? Oh, man. I Seriously. Saw that, I saw like two hours later, there were like already people selling his shirts of like, I survived a New York uh, earthquake. And here's the thing. It's... People are already trying to steal it from New Jersey. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. First off, I, I have, I have many thoughts. Um, First thought is 
thank you to Mary for grabbing this clip. Chat, show some show some love to Mary for that. The audio and the visuals on that were perfect. So thank you. Uh, thank you to Mary for that. So that was the first thought. Second thought is, Adrian, that was fantastic timing on your count, um, but a thought occurs. It's like a normal thing to time out your counting seconds by adding a word after it. Like you might say one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. That's like the American version. Is there a German version of that? And then if so, what is the word that you say to yourself silently as you time out seconds? Do you, is, that, um, is that just a stupid American thing? Actually, uh, some I know some Germans also use Mississippi. Like it's that has made it way over here. Um, I know <laughs> for for at, at least uh, so we use for for when I was a child and we would like try to measure the distance from between lightning and thunder. Like you know this thing of like, hey, I try to gather how far the uh, lightning storm is away from me. We used the the German word for elephant, which is elephant. So it's like a oh, one elephant, two elephant, three elephant. That's also what we did. So um, uh, that's that's a thing. But I I just do breaks. Like when I count, I just like do like I, I think I've just break pattern. That's my yeah. way to do it. That works. Chat is coming up with excellent German. <laughs> one yeah. October. Oh yeah, two, two October. I don't... That's that's uh, Daniel TV. Daniel TV has a good point. Uh, we also count from twenty one. That's also used sometimes. So you say 21, 22, 23, which is 21, 22, 23, which also works from the pattern. It's like our 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000 kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. One Bratwurst, yeah. two Bratwurst, three Bratwurst. Thank you, Doug. That was amazing. Well, you had uh, NSF officials saying one sausage <laughs> eating, two sausage eating. Uh, yeah, yep, yep, that was good. That made me laugh. And Chris, I, are you... yes. and Chris hitting the chat with the English command. <laughs> <laughs> excellent um sawyer what's your what's your oh it's, are we supposed to do questions is that the honk for questions uh, but i want to know what sawyer uses for his second counting do you, do you have to, uh, so just a quick note on this do you have sometimes the feeling that kevin is starting to implement uh sounds in our head that he can like condition us to do certain things on stream? yes no it's very okay, pavlovian just, yeah it's very it must <laughs> really be question time i can't hear it I can't Go ahead, it. so yeah, I, I was interrupting there because I was making a funny joke. No, it, it, literally, I was, Kevin did the train noise, another train is going by, which, wow, there was a lot of them tonight. Holy smokes. I wonder if he timed it. Like, he knows roughly when they're going to go by because it happens at the same time roughly every time. So I wouldn't put it past him. Um, okay. But, uh, then... Yeah, I count by using the stopwatch on my phone. Fine. Uh, Otherwise, 1,000. And then finally to tie it back around, third thought is earthquakes, huh? <laughs> I love when, when an earthquake happens in L.A., it's, uh, it's like, okay, earthquake. You know, every, all, all the L.A. people on social media are like, there was an earthquake. It's no big deal. Earthquake happens in New York. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, my God, T-shirts. Um, it's pretty great. I saw a casualty Anyways. from it, though, on social media. It was a uh, cup of coffee that was knocked over. <sighs> Dang. <laughs> it's, it's a, let's just it's a sharp let's salute just, Sawyer Thank I you. have never experienced a, like a measurable earthquake in my life I uh, I definitely remember the 7.1 I think it was that hit Trona um, a couple years back it was like you know a couple hundred miles from LA but LA still got rocked uh, that was intense but yeah earthquakes it's a thing Adrian I will never forget when you were here for flight one and there was the uh the storm warning that went out remember that you, me you remember that you may <laughs> mean when michael took a picture of me uh being scared at the door and being like <laughs> and posted it being like german sees weather for the first time yes um, <laughs> yes yeah yes. i remember that so just for context uh there, there was a, like a there was a tornado warning actually we got like all the tornado warning on the on the phone and i of course I never got a tornado warning in my life before. So the Americans were very chill about this and like not even bothered. And I was scared. So yeah. I'm I'm sorry that we made light of you being scared, but it was it, in in my defense, it was uh, highly amusing. It was like you were like the dog at the at the door, like waiting for the mailman to come or something. It was just uh, yeah, weather, it happens. Whether Anyways. or not you like it. 
Hey, let's do some questions. How about rails? Um, how about no, that? No rails. <laughs> we can do questions. Andy's asking if SpaceX achieve orbit, uh, to achieve the objective of safe return and landing of the ship, how many years away would you say uh, we are from crewed flights, and do you think they will meet the Artemis goal? How far away are we from crewed flights if Flight 4 successfully re recovers the ship, and do you think they'll achieve Artemis goal? Sawyer, go first. I mean, I, I still think we're a bunch of iterations away in terms of... It's hard to tell, because, you know, you can go by booster number... And ship number, or you can go by actual time. Because, I mean, in terms of timing, I think that they can get it done in the next three years or so. I think they'll be able to, by the time Artemis 3 gets ready, which keeps getting pushed back, uh, I think they'll be ready by then. The question is getting it all ready, getting it certified, and how many ships and boosters worth of practice it's going to take to prove that, hey, this is a reliable system. It can reliably launch, deliver cargo. Now we feel comfortable enough having it to be able to launch people into space. So I think we're probably about 20 generations of away in terms of booster and ship. But I, I think we're three or four years away from the first you know, crew rating testing. All right, I'd buy that. Adrian? Uh, it's Artemis three crewed flight. That's my first. That's my first question because technically it's not lifting off with crew. It's just launching uh, a lunar lander into a lunar orbit and then functioning as a lander. So I want to like first clarify: Is Artemis three technically a crewed rocket, like s from the Starship side? I'm I, I, I'm just saying because it's not completing several parts of that are very critical for for a crude flight, which is the ascent and descent part, which are not involving crew at all. Well, like, I mean, yeah, not that's, even... a good, that's a good question. Yeah, because it will have crew on it at some point, just not on Earth. Yeah. Huh. It's, it's a, a, so, I think Artemis 3 will be the first time that crew is on a starship. That's my, my first take here. Um, because I, I think that's the even though it's a moon landing, it's still one of the safest things you can probably do with the Starship system because it doesn't involve like a belly flop. Um, so that's probably why I think it's most likely the first time that a crew will be involved. Of course, the Starship program is very fluid, so at every point in time, there's always chances to for it to adjust. Um, yeah, I'm with I'm with Sawyer. I, I mean, does anybody here think that Artemis three will happen in 2026? Um, because I did, don't. I think it will be I, twenty. I, I'm going twenty twenty seven. I think Artemis three will be the first time that crew is on a starship, and I think it will happen in twenty twenty seven. I was going to go twenty eight. You're being generous. Yeah, I, I mean, I could see twenty seven. Sure. I'm I'm being hopeful. I, I think. I think there's a lot of systems that are getting slow. Like I'm, I'm. I think out of like honestly, I think flight three made me more optimistic than I was. I think if you asked me before, flight three will Starship um, will Starship be ready for 2027? I would have probably said, oh, I don't know. It's it's, and that that's not saying like, oh, I think SpaceX is is, is failing in any way. I think it's an incredibly complex system and then so many complicated problems they have to solve. Um, so I, I don't think this is like, oh, will SpaceX fail? I, I think they're just trying something that is so ambitious that it's it's just hard to do in this time frame. Um, I think Flight 3 showed me that they have already reliability of some sort in this program, which is impressive. Like, flawless booster sent two times in a row, That's that, that's, that just surprised me. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think think the cadence will help them with the fact that we will get what five more flights this year that's well that's so much data that's so much experience so yeah i think next year for demo maybe late next year for demo i think like late 2025 for the hls demo with the uh, uncrewed landing and then uh 2027 for artemis 3 and road has opened hey look at that the road's open Yay. hooray and just another part of today's test that appeared to go extremely smoothly 
you know, they're not keeping the road closed until 10 p.m. tonight as they clear out the pad of any volatile, like, no, the road's open. It's fine. They, they didn't have any issues with today's test at all. It's really remarkable. And, and Adrian, you, you saying five more tests this year, seeing this pace, I would believe five more tests this year. I think I think five or six is like the the range is right now for me is four to six. I think it's from the hardware perspective, unless something goes horrible wrong. Uh, I think four is kind of safe. Like there there are ships and boosters and flow. That's 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 working. Uh, you you approach at some point that point where the V two switch might just stop your cadence a bit. But I think like four is safe. Six is maybe the upper corridor. So I think that's like realistically where we are with Starship right now for for this year. Like in in so basically combined, I would say five to seven flights um, this year. So you're saying four to six that. more? Yes, I'm saying four to six more. I think realistically four is probably the safe one, and six would be like. Well, for six, I think you start to get into a territory of like you need to avoid mishap investigations. Otherwise, that's gonna be hard. Yeah, and see, my thought would be to go like four to six this year, which is still a really high cadence. And again, if they hit the six yeah. in that range, then that's kind of what you're thinking as well. At this rate, once they get that down, as you mentioned, they don't have to keep doing all of these self reports and then get everything approved with the FAA and then signed off and all of that. And once they get you know, good at it, basically, and even better, I should say, because they're already pretty good at it, then maybe we'll see the pace pick up. But my vote would be four to six total flights this year. So was that three to five more? Yeah, which which I think is like still like a very like we are we are still in the same ballpark here. Like it's not yeah. like it's not like some of us say like one of us says three and the other says nine. So I think we are all like if 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 somebody told me at the like if we had arrived at the end of this year and we had five flights, none of us here would be like, like I think shocked based on where we are right now. Just to like, yeah, no arguments for me, and that's really exciting because that means we're gonna see Starship fly a lot of times in the coming months and years, and that's what we're all here for. Yep, Space Pope. The Space Pope, thank you for gifting the five red team memberships. Be sure to thank Space Pope if you got one of those. Mern, MRN, thank you for the support. They say, does version 2 also include an upgrade to the booster? This is something I think we kind of assume, but not necessarily something that's been you know tweeted by Elon or SpaceX necessarily. Right, Adrian? I mean... <laughs> Okay, this is this is an incredible simplification, but I would call the booster a bit simpler right now versus the ship. The ship has all of these re-entry parts and that are still in flow and has the whole payload mechanism. The booster kind of is very much defined by the 33 Raptors below it. Like that's, it's primarily just this tank with 33 Raptors below it. The ship has more more complex parts that can change a bit, especially with the payloads uh, deployment, especially with the flaps and everything. So I think what we will see on the booster side would be Raptor upgrades, would be thrust upgrades. Like there will be changes. The booster feels a bit like like it will be determined by Raptor changes mostly. Once they have more thrust, that might change Raptor layout, that might change Raptor numbers. Um, we'll see. But uh, overall, I think while the while the ship is more the ship is more fluid, like you can play with all of these like arrow surfaces, and you can play with like so many different things. That's that's I think the difference on the po but on the both. Oh, it's Jake. Jake and I. Agree. Hi, Jake. Hi, Jake. I know people uh, were asking Jake? for him. He's made his appearance. Jake showed up just in time to thank GunFox61 for gifting 50 red team memberships. That's Whoa. insane. Thank you so much, GunFox. I can just see chat just scrolling by rapidly now with everybody that was just gifted a membership. 50 people now. Be sure to thank GunFox or whoever gifts you a membership. It's the coolest thing. I'm so glad that uh, YouTube implemented that feature 
and GunFox, that's a huge amount of support. And it's a huge amount of generosity to 50 people out there who are watching the stream. So thank you on their behalf and thank you on NFF, NSF's behalf. That's a truly outstanding thing to do. So thank you for that. Um, for Jake the nozzle, for you. Yeah, Jake, Jake showed up just for GunFox. <laughs> the Nozzle gifting a membership. Thank you, a Red Team one. Uh, Stefan becoming a Padrat member. Thank you, Stefan. And Amy with a store purchase. Thank you for that, Amy. They say, love your products. The metal prints are such amazing quality. Hoping to get another one soon. I got one for my son for Christmas, and he got one for me. Oh, that's amazing. Great minds think alike. I've traveled from Illinois for both Flight 1 and 2, and I'm hooked. That's amazing. Well, thank you for the kind words. Um, it really means a lot. It's really cool that you're able to share um, the enjoyment of rocketry with uh, with your son. And what a, what a cool story. You both got each other a print for Christmas. Um, I don't, I don't even know what to say. That's that's really amazing. Thank you for uh, grabbing that T-shirt. We got the hot staging shirt. Nice. All right, more questions. Can we get a honk? Isn't it true? No. no honk. All right, more questions. Bill is asking booster. There we, there go. we go. Booster twelve and ship thirty uh, were the last to be cryoed. Do you think Massey's will be able to cryo with all the changes going on there? So they are doing a lot of work at Massey's building out that ship static fire stand. Um, and we haven't, I mean, there was a period of time there, a couple months last year and early this year, where vehicles were just headed to Massey's nonstop. It seemed as soon as they had a ship and a booster there and done, they moved them back and then took the next ship and booster out. I mean, we have the current cadence to thank for that sort of flow. But haven't seen anything go to Massey's in a while. Do you think that's largely up to the construction work going on there adrian sawyer i'll let you continue to become one with jake this is the most yeah. adorable thing i've ever seen in my life hey, but yeah, adrian can comfy. answer can can we look at jake while adrian talks can we do that well he just turned his head away from the camera but all right fine um yeah i mean i would be very surprised if they are not uh making sure that massey's is up to par for further testing i mean uh Massey's is basically their their now go to cryo station, and uh, that's just how they perform it. So, if there are changes needed, well, a that would also affect the orbital launch mount, so they would need to modify both anyway. Um, and I think uh, they are not going away from, especially with this ramping up cadence, they need to be able to test at Massey's. Like they can, if you if you want to get four, five, six launches this year. Massey's needs to work. Like otherwise, you cannot you cannot lock your pad so many days and still get to this cadence because every day you're cryo testing a booster that would prevent work on the um, work continuing on the orbital launch mount. Um, <laughs> I had to get it. Like at the moment I started that sentence, I had to get it in there. So I I think uh, it, it just makes sense from a natural flow perspective that. We will never. I I will go on the record here. We will never see a classic just boost a cryo test again at the orbital launch site, uh, unless and here comes my unless uh, we reach this once we reach the second pad because I could see like them putting any booster just on the second pad and just performing some cryo tests with it um, just to get the second pad ready. Jake was looking at you the whole time. By the way, that with the way the camera is, he was looking right at you. He agrees. And I was and I was looking at Jake. Uh, sorry, Adrian. I was listening, but uh, can Jake be more adorable right now? I don't think it's possible. Every time I think he can't, he does. Like this, we've seen the Jake cameo multiple times, but now he can, get rid of the ticker. Get rid of the ticker. Hang on. What if I close that? We need more Jake. More Jake. More better. Oh, I'm Jake. There Aww. we go. He's just a little buddy. My buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, all right. <laughs> at, at the risk of becoming NASA cat flight, um, <laughs> let's do some more questions. Tanner, this is it for Adrian. Tanner is asking, when flight for patch, Adrian? <laughs> we have a version. That's the update. We, we like, uh, spoiler, we are working on it. Uh, with we, I mean, mo mostly Pauline. Uh, that's the... Um, that's the thing. Uh, we will reveal it once we are closer to flight. Um, it's 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 amazing. That's gonna. That's what I'm gonna say. 
Uh, I will not show it today. It's not ready for showcase yet. But uh, yes, we will. We will. We are working on getting a flight patch ready for flight four. There, there you go. Can I? Can I? I'm not going to say anything about it other than I yeah. did see it earlier today. Yeah. Or a version of the early version of it, and yeah. it slaps. So that's all. That's all I'm going to say. I probably already said too much, Adrian. I'm sorry. No, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, we we more more not more not yet ready because uh, you know once like we really like to have this ready for like around the full stack wet rest getting ready to fly stage. So right. Yeah, it's like really that. cool looking. Says the person who hasn't seen it yet. Kent in chat says, "Put Jake on patch." Also, Sawyer, I. I I was not trying to flex, but for once, I think I, I outflexed you because I've seen it already, and you haven't. So for once, yeah. you normally, Sawyer, normally your Sawyer flexes get me every time, but not today. Um, yeah. Mighty is saying, will it ever be feasible to have FTS installation uh, and arming directly from the tower and eliminate the need to de-stack? It kind of already is armed in a way with the tower because the tower has the inhibit. Um, the inhibit. I don't even know what you call them. Plugs? The inhibit Inhibitor. system? Yeah, the inhibitor. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Words. Um, so they do pull the pins or whatever on the ground and then stack it. Of course, they have to install the FTS on the ground, but it currently kind of already is armed by the tower. I, I don't know. It's Who has thoughts? Go. Um, yeah, so, uh, I think we are called, basically what this question is mostly referring to is like, uh, will they be able, be able to have is this system in a full stack configuration and have somebody go up to the ship and pull the pins? Like that's, that's because right now we have the situation after the wet rest rehearsal, if they do one, they would need to unstack again, install the FTS and pull the pins. Uh, that's right now what the oper process of operation is. The reason for that is that there is no cherry picker or man lift or anything that can reach up to the point where the flight termination system is at the ship. So um, could they install an arm for that? Yes. Um, I th There's another problem here, and I will totally excuse myself from not being an expert on this. There might be... FAA regulations or any like regulations on flight termination systems that you are not allowed to use like a uh, hundred meter tall uh, system to pull pins on explosive C4 devices. I I don't know. <laughs> like I don't I I don't have uh, the knowledge if that's actually a regulatory. I actually asked that once. And I didn't get a like proper answer from the FAA. But um, yeah, it's it might just come down to the fact what is safe to do because in the end. And that's that's another thing. Uh, we have seen how things at that point in the air, like we are talking about almost 100 meters or so, they t start to swing, right? There's more wind, there's, there, there's things that just start to swing. And they are still operating on harnesses and everything on <laughs> explosive charges. So is it really that big of a deal to unstack and make this safely for now? Or like, like for the medium term... Uh, medium, um, what medium time frame? Let's go with that. Um, I would not think so. I think uh, it's it, it's it's explosive after all. So you don't want to be, you don't want to make any experiments with explosive charges. Not unless you're explosions and fire or extractions and ire on YouTube, who is amazing. <laughs> all right, yeah, do this it. stuff is good. Uh, let's see, Jerwa. This is a good one from Jerwa. This is basically a question for Alex, um, but I'm going to ask it anyways. They say, have you created any GSE replenishment timetables? It seems like refill of the consumables will inevitably become the bottleneck with the current setup. This is something I think about, oh, I don't know, like not all the time, but fairly frequently where right now all of the consumables at Starbase are trucked in along Highway 4. It's a two-lane road, you know, one lane each way. And it is very rough and so much traffic from so many heavy loads every single day. It like, absolutely tanks its toll on Highway 4 and they're constantly filling in potholes and refurbishing sections of it and all of that. But 
you have to think with like the several hundred tanker trucks that it takes to fill one full stack. That's got to become the bottleneck at some point. How do they actually replenish properly at 39A? Like, Sawyer, um, like, what's the, like, do they have pipelines for RP1 and stuff? There's that air liquid facility. Is that, that's part of it, right, Sawyer? Air liquid is there, but yet at the same time, uh, not all of that is, not all of it comes directly from there. In fact, some of it gets trucked in from across the state. So I believe there's one from Jacksonville. There's one from West Palm Beach that they will take it and then bring up, you know, the liquefied gases to the Cape where they load them up. So it's kind of similar to Starbase. I think the main difference is the scale that we're talking about here. Yeah, because, you know, you could have truck come every single day like you do at Starbase, let's say, and you'll have plenty for all of the launches that are happening every four days for a Falcon 9 versus Starship. If you're trying to do that every four days, that's a lot of trucks. Yeah. Gunfox says KSC has four inflows, three from Florida, one from Georgia. Thank you, Gunfox. And Alex says that they haven't uh, started making timetables for GSE replenishment. <laughs> um, they haven't, or Alex hasn't? <laughs> Alex hasn't. Alex hasn't. I, I also want to add, I think it's not a bottleneck right now, or like not even close to it, because we see closer to flights that they are able to heavily ramp up the cadence on supplies. Like, you always... If, if you're if you're like Jack, you're probably more witness to this than everybody else. Anybody else, but from what I can see, like they are able to just chain uh, propellant deliveries close to flight, and you see like truck deliveries all day. And right now, they are not having to do that all month for schedule this. Yes, there are some deliveries, but we are not seeing like this crazy chain uh, that we see close to flights, which they could do all day, basically. Right. Yeah, that's a really good question, Jerwa. Thank you. Also, I'm just... Jake is killing me. I'm dying. I love Jake. Tell me about it. He's melted in my arms. He's just sitting there slow blinking at you. He loves you. Oh, right now his eyes are kind of closed. He was sleeping for a bit. He's so far Aww. away. What a buddy. Yeah. Saul is asking, do you guys think there will be an attempt at a catch landing this year, or is it 2025? You know, the problem, Jack, is that I don't track the trucks. Go ahead. You should. You should, Alex. Do better. Um, you, have, you don't have enough to do. Do more, Alex. Whoosh. <laughs> let, me, let me... This year... Yeah, catch attempt this year, question mark, dot, 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 exclamation mark, question mark, open parentheses, will they, close parentheses, hashtag... YOLO. <laughs> I'm just trying to make Booster. Sawyer mad. Booster yes, ship no. There you go. I still think it's going to be both next year. I mean, All right, well, there you have it. Well, we have the, I think you both know, are the, equally plausible. We saw, actually, finally in the video that SpaceX released the other day of what happened to the boost uh, as it went down and, you know, basically impacted. So I think it's going to take them a little bit to get it worked out. And let's say there are four or five flights this year. Once they get that perfected, I could see them doing it very, like the first flight of 25 doing it. Yeah, that would be awesome. I can't wait. And John Sharp is asking, will the vehicles be able to, tra be, able to be transported horizontally now that they have been strengthened? So we've seen additional stringers on both the ship and the booster with this iteration, but I don't think that necessarily has anything to do with horizontal transportation do you adrian i think um i think probably pressurized it should be able to transport like semi-pressurized uh it probably is able to be transported horizontally um i do not like we have seen starship being pretty sturdy versus some other rockets um i i mean look at flight one that's that vehicle started to spin and was still semi-intact. There are other rockets that wouldn't be able to handle that, like spin horizontal uh, forces. Uh, that would just crumble. And I, I think Starship being semi-pressurized is pretty sturdy. Um, I think it would be able to transport, be able to transport it horizontally. 
Yeah, I mean, we have we've heard scuttlebutt about that happening with ships to Kennedy Space Center at some point in boosters, um, but no real sign of that so far. There was like a cool, weird new piece of hardware outside of the former Star Factory building that kind of looked like a cradle, but it wasn't anywhere near beefy enough. Probably completely unrelated, but suffice to say, as soon as any kind of hardware for uh, for something like that, or for version two of Starship shows up, we'll have videos about it on the channel and talk about it in the daily videos and in the commentated videos, all that stuff. So stay tuned, and as developments happen, we will bring them to you. So wrapping all of this up, I think we're we're pretty good on Starship. Um, kind of ran the gamut there, but Booster's already basically defrosted, and the road is open. By all accounts. A nice clean static fire today with Booster 11. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One step closer what, to what, Flight 4. What do you guys want to talk about next? We could talk about the Eclipse. We could talk about Stoke doing uh, engine firing. Awesome. No, showing first stage engines. Uh, or we could engine. talk about Polaris. What do we... I feel like I should roll a dice or something right now. Roll a die. Honestly, I, I think the dice. Celestial event coming up eclipses all the other stories. So. Nice. Nice. Thank you. Ray, I, don't tell me you're going to bring out the D20s. How many dice yeah. do you need? Uh, oh roll me a D20. Oh, um, wait. Did I grab a... I actually grabbed the D20. Uh, let's see. This is a 12. I try, what I does try that say to uh, discuss Eclipse on NSF Live. What do I roll? But, but dice. <laughs> <laughs> let's th discuss the eclipse <laughs> alright so eclipse is on Monday the forecast for a large part of the path is cloudy uh, but improving I believe over the last day or so but yeah I'm planning on going to McGregor and it's not looking particularly great cloud cover wise Sawyer you were going to come to Texas but um, not anymore huh no I've just based off of a combination of things, uh, yeah, I decided with the forecast being as iffy as it is, uh, I'm not going to be flying out to Texas. I mean, that means I'll be here for Bandwagon and Delta Four Heavy's final flight, but yeah, no. Uh, unfortunately, I'll be away just with the concerns of all those clouds and personal stuff. It's a shame, but I did see the one in 2017, so at least there was that. Yeah, and here's the thing. Like, I want to do two things with this segment. One is I want to encourage anybody that can to go try and get under the path of totality because it's really cool to see an eclipse. That's part of it. The other part of it is, you know what? Eclipses are not rare. What's rare is the eclipse going directly over a large swath of the U.S. Eclipses happen all the time. If you really want to see a total eclipse, there are you know, you can find each year where there's going to be a total eclipse and just go there to see it. So I, I like anybody that either gets clouded out or is unable to travel for it. Um, and I'm telling this to myself as much as anyone, because I'm probably going to get clouded out. You know what? Eclipses are not rare. They're super insanely cool, but they're not rare. So do not fret if for whatever reason you can't see this one or you do try and you get clouded out. Eclipses aren't rare. That, that yeah. This is the... This is the thing I tell myself to be less stressed about the eclipse as we rapidly that's, approach it. That's what I've been saying to myself all day as I've been deciding, do I still fly out? Do I not fly out? It was the same thought I process. I mean, we have, we have one in 2026, another total one, a 2027, 2028, 2030. It's, to there are total eclipses to watch. It's just yeah. a matter of how, how much do you want to fly to watch an eclipse? Right. right. The next one in the U.S. is exactly 20 years from now in 2044. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, not to the day, Neat. but 2044 is the next U.S. one, 20 years from now. Super cool. So, yeah, just once again, if you're anywhere along this path, especially if the clouds are looking good, but even if not, because uh, certain cloudy conditions, it can still be really neat to see. Just go. Just go. I've had so many friends message me on social media or text me over the last... I don't know, two, three weeks asking me if they should go or ask me what I'm doing for it. And I cannot encourage people enough. Um, if you're able, 
and willing to, you know, potentially get clouded out or what have you, go into it with an open mind, but it should be pretty, um, pretty darn amazing. I mean, totality is awesome, huh, Sawyer? It's, it's one of the coolest things. And I think what surprised me the most the first time I saw it, well, the only time, was the color. You see all the pictures of the eclipses, and it looks like everything is pitch black. Because that's how you get to see all the detail and the corona and everything. But it's not. It's a purplish, bluish color. It's dark. Kind of like black, but it's more blue-purple than it is black. It's a color I'd never seen before. It also kind of feels like someone put it into Photoshop and took the saturation and dropped it all the way down to zero. <laughs> if you look at the ground and everything around you, it's weird. Everything goes like sepia almost. Oh, hey, Alex. Yeah, I, that, I plan to go to is the that one it? in that's Spain. The only, and... That's the yeah. only thing we get from Alex? Is he just going to say sepia and then go away? I was I was gonna say it's sepia, just like it's orange, but nah, um, uh, I'm too dumb. Um, I'm gonna go see the one in 2028, and I think it's no, it's yeah, no, it's 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 August 2020. No, it's August 2027 in Spain. 27 Spain, 28 I believe is Australia. Yeah, hi, Spanish person here. Uh we have <laughs> one in 2026 and another in 2027. Yes, August. Uh one the one in 2027 goes over the northeast of Spain, and then uh, the one in 2027, it goes over the Strait of Gibraltar. Bye. That, bye. bye. Uh, the Gibraltar one, I think that that is going to be um, ripe for awesome imagery. Because that, I mean, holy cow, what a beautiful area for an eclipse to pass over. I'm looking forward to see you there, Jack. We will meet up in Gibraltar. Yes, it's going to be a chaotically good time. Let's do it. Perfect. Chaos. Nice. Team. So, so you're also joining. Perfect. We're getting like like half of NSF just there. Gibraltar, hang out at the eclipse, and then yeah, we get full on clouds. If that's Starship dangerous won. because then that's going to be when Artemis three will happen. Just saying. I was just Don't yeah. I was even. just going to say it'll be a it'll be a double Starship launch with a side of SLS on the same day or something, and then also they'll. They'll bring Delta Four Heavy back for one more launch yeah, just, somehow. Yeah. Don't yeah, just, even. Don't. Even. Yeah, it's like the so just to put this like I'm not sure if like this this is a funny discussion that ha happens at NSF right now or like especially with us here because we we try to cover rockets and solar eclipses and the good thing is the solar eclipse doesn't move. That's I like solar eclipses because they don't they don't move. It's it's one certain point where we can all plan for. The problem is all the rockets around it move. Uh, yeah, but I know, but like Actually, the, the rockets move. around it move all the time. So you have Delta for heavy, which is, let's say, uh, it's it has the tendency to move a bit. Uh, is that is that a fair assessment? Of, sorry, yes. would you describe uh, a Jack? Like it, it Delta for heavy is just sometimes moves a bit. Well, technically, a... this is kind of what's happening with the eclipse too. If you get somewhere where it's cloudy. It's essentially scrubbed. You didn't get to see it, so you have to wait till the next one, which is, you know, it's the same concept. If it's clear, great, it'll launch. Otherwise, if not, you have to wait till the next flight, which with Delta IV Heavy, it's, this is the last one, but with the eclipses, you have another couple of years. True. You will never be able to see Delta IV Heavy launch again. You will be able to see more eclipses. That's true. That's that is why very true. I, that's why I've made the... That was a big part of the decision to stay here near the Space Coast. Yeah, I, I, that's a fair call and, a, and a, like makes perfect sense. It hurts. It hurts um, a bit inside. But for those of you hey, that Jack, get to before see it, you move on, take awesome pictures. Yes, Kevin? Yes, uh, this is God from above. Uh, before you move on, I just wanted to mention that we have people all over the country. Um, and we have been, you know, out there testing. Uh, we got these, this photo from Jack today. Um, oh, that's this... the bad one. Do the other one. Oh, you want <laughs> this one? We got yeah, this so photo. I spent, I spent a whole crap load of money on a, it's on a hydrogen alpha solar telescope. This is a normal camera lens with Thousand Oaks optical film on it, which I highly recommend if you're looking for something to put in front of a camera lens. And go, okay, so go back to the other one. 
that is hydrogen alpha. That is like a special solar filter. You can see the solar flares and stuff in it, but it's nowhere near as sharp as the other lens. But that's what I'm going to be capturing the eclipse with um, and streaming the eclipse with, with NSF. And 30 other cameras, you said? Yes. We have Kevin? about 30 cameras. And I, I just want to say not everyone went out and spent thousands of dollars on a telescope jack <laughs> yeah we no i'm also, an idiot gage has put a solar filter on his ptz uh, yeah. and it looks great i don't have a oh actually wait i do have a picture of one of gage's ptz uh shots so, so you know we're 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 trying and then we ryan insists that he's going to see um the eclipse from uh, the UK, so he has more sunglasses or solar glasses than any of us have, uh, <laughs> but he's he's prepared. So, if he uh, wanted to fly here and be a roadside grifter with those glasses, he could probably make the cost of a plane ticket and then some. Easily. <laughs> For sure. For sure. And then Did I just want to... Did... Um, We've also partnered up with uh, a couple other organizations, including the um, Rochester Museum and Science Center and uh, a group called Office Hours, which is a bunch of video professionals. So you can see all these pins that we have on this map right here. And uh, we've got people all over the country, including some people that are uh, slightly outside of the uh, total totality. But uh, that's OK. We're still going to get some great images and uh, we're going to have some fun on Monday. Even if there are clouds, there's going to be places in the country that won't have clouds. Absolutely. And Kevin, I know you and the team have been busting your butts on this, so thanks for that. Like, This is the kind of coverage to, that we can pull off attempting to thwart the weather and the clouds. So, uh, you know, photo gods willing, we'll have some awesome views on Eclipse Day. And it'll be really interesting to compare feeds, right, Kevin? Like, here's a feed from Texas or somewhere south that's not cloudy, because Texas is probably going to be cloudy. Um, here's a feed from up New York. Oh, it doesn't, hasn't even started in New York or, or what have you. So that will be pretty cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. You know, it's, it's one singular event that affects... 99% of the country, at least, you know, the United States. And I think that's really cool that we're all looking at the same thing, but we're all going to see something completely different based on where we are. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's just a, you know, you can think about how we exist on a planet, which is a giant sphere hurtling through space and which is circled by another sphere, which is the moon, which is circling a sphere that's the sun. And then it's another thing to like visualize that so viscerally by seeing the moon occlude the sun in that way, it's going to be a real treat. So, yeah, Eclipse. Thank you for, for jumping in there, Kevin. Uh, you said that far better than I possibly could have. You're welcome, Jack. I think um, I should do this. Oh, questions. Let's see if we have some Eclipse <laughs> questions. Uh, Joe is asking Sawyer where you're going to be for Delta Four Heavy KSC Jetty Park Playa Linda. Uh, probably uh with the rest of the media for this one for Delta Four Heavy. So they take us aboard um the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. So yeah, don't try and go in there otherwise, because they have things that are aimed and targeted at people who don't who shouldn't be in there. Right. Crocodiles? Uh, but where would... Yeah. Yes, also, cro yeah, also alligators. Um, but where would you recommend for someone that can't go to KSC? I would... For this one, I think I would recommend Cars Park. It'd probably be a great view of 37. Uh, it's $5 to get in. Bye, Jake. But it's... I think that would be a great spot. Um, I think pretty much... Anywhere along that water line there would be good. So you could probably, you won't see it until it lifts off, but somewhere like um, Playa, or, um, Jetty Park or any of the beaches down that way, you'd still get a good view. I'm trying to think where else. Oh, wait, we have a video that can tell you all the places as well on the channel. Yeah, excellent. Let's see if we can get that in chat. Speaking of chat, Marte, uh, I'm not, I can't even, I'm not going to try and pronounce their last name, but Marte is asking, please. Please pet the cat, please. This was a while ago, but I don't know Jake's gone. But I've been I, I just him had the whole to... time. Don't worry. Oh, I, I just had to say it. I just had to say it. <laughs> um, more questions. 
Dr. K. Holly, hi, Dr. Holly, is saying, Jack, you cleared out the clouds for the annular eclipse, so I'm betting you'll do that again. Uh, thank you? I, I'm... Is... What? Isn't Jack like known for more like the opposite, like more like Stop it. summoning Stop clouds? Stop it. Stop it. Just... <laughs> Stop it. Uh, you know, we'll we'll see how it goes. Ultimately, if I get clouded out, it's not a huge deal. Um, I've seen, I saw the 2017 one; it was amazing. I obviously want to see this one and make cool photos of it, but we have so many people working on getting so many cool views from around the country. That you know what, uh, the stream should be epic either way, even if the small patch of ground I'm standing on ends up having clouds over it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Daniel B is asking Jack, "Will you be eating tacos during the eclipse?" Uh, the high likelihood. I mean, especially because I know it would make you mad. Yeah. By the way, for the people that were asking, you know, where I'm going to be watching it from. If you happen to see any of us out and about at the Cape, feel free to come up and say hi. We even have special patches and everything for if you run into us in the wild. It's, it's like a Pokemon uh, gym badge. <laughs> Twice them all. To, disclaimer, you have not to beat the photographers in battle to get the gym badge. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so that is a thing. Like When you see us down here in Starbase or when you see folks at the Cape, like we have stickers and we have like NSF patches or whatever. It's just not like the flight patch. It's just a patch that says NSF on it, like the, the logo. Um, right now, right now it's three different ones. I think now yeah. I want to, I want to get five more in. So we have eight batches that you can collect. If you find eight NSFers in the wild. Well, <laughs> the, the idea of having like a gym leader badge for each, for each NSF person. And then it's like, then it's like, collect them all. Oh my God. Oh, this is, Sawyer, this is so if, tempting now to do. It's what have really... you done Sawyer? I mean, I Mine... think Julia and I already have different colors, so. What would be what would be your gym leader patch, Sawyer? Ooh. You mean well, I mean, mine would obviously be bacon. It would be a little little bacon patch. Like that's it. Fairly simple. Uh, um, on mine, the shuttle part in the NSF logo would say Endeavor. Nice, Adrian. What would be your gym leader patch? I don't know, but it would have to call us green and white because that's my favorite colors, um, which is not only my favorite football club, but also the colors of Excel. So um, <laughs> it's... <laughs> that's why uh, it's your favorite but... color? Nerd. No, that's why? It's two, two things that just per happily align. Excel is the best software on my PC. Anyway. Um... Better than Steam? Hearsay! <laughs> Wow. No, Steam is just a platform to the games. Okay, um, fine. Like like if I play, I don't know, Cyberpunk, it's not the, the game like it's not Steam that is amazing, it's Cyberpunk that's cool. By the way, Jerome's saying that Adrian should be a, magic. Adrian should be a Kevin... Jets fan. No, don't don't put that curse on him, Jerwa. Let him enjoy <laughs> his team that actually wins. Yeah, I have to. I have the tendency to curse every team I cheer for. Uh, that's that's ab absolutely. I, I will not dive deep to this because I know sports uh, annoy people. But I have done extensive research about that. The moment I start to cheer cheer for a team, it starts to become incredibly bad. So uh, I have started to think about putting bribes about that. And like the less least bitter, I will cheer for that team next season. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting strategy. Uh, Kevin, what would be your gym leader patch? Probably darkness, uh, because I'm always sitting in the dark studio. It could be like a black hexagon, there you like go. you know, like a like a tile. There you go. Yeah, I mean, nice. also, no one would ever get my patch because they'll never see me. I would get it. They're stalking my studio. Well. You know, um, it'll, it'll keep things interesting. <laughs> hey, I managed to see a real life That's Kevin not an Michael invitation. Reed. He does. A it real does life exist? Kevin Michael Reed exists. I got, I got to meet him in the wild. That's how I felt when I first met Michael. I was like, "You are real." <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's mosey on over to the next topic here. Eclipse, the TLDR. Go see it. If you can't, no big deal. There's more of them. Um, there you go. It's gonna be awesome. Who wants to talk about Stoke showing off their first stage engines? This is super neat. I love Stoke. Yeah, I mean, 
it's it's amazing what they are doing and the fact like you we have all been talking about like their second stage right because that's the like the big talking point so far but they are also developing like a metalox full full, full full stage combustion engine so like a raptor equivalent uh, and there it is like they have started to show it uh this is the first stage engine for their rocket which will be used uh for the reusable first stage again for the people who maybe are not fully in the loop with stoke stoke is uh, a company that has started development on a fully reusable launch vehicle uh with uh if with a like aero spike heat very weird heat shield design on the second stage like a very unique design super cool uh we have seen hop tests from them and they are also developing a reusable first stage which is uh yeah i, I i'm looking forward to see more uh that we can see more in it we also had for example andy lapsa already on the show here which was such a great talk uh really loved the Box from Stoke, and uh, I'm super haha, stoked to see more of their progress. But yeah, uh -huh. it seems like they are now uh, after they they started a lot of testing around their second stage engine, which also is a very unique design. They're now moving also in the first stage readiness for their for their rocket. And um, honestly, it's it's what I mean. There you can see the bottom of the second stage, basically the hopper test, and it's such a cool cool thing. I I mean we lo I think the the one thing that I love about them is we all love things that are not normal I think about rockets like <laughs> things yep. that are just weird and new and I think their second stage is the definition of like cool new stuff and, Yeah they somehow uh, they somehow figured out a way to be even weirder and crazier than Starhopper and in, in a lot of ways it's it's unlike Starhopper in that it, to me it feels like a much more um, realistic representation of their final second stage design obviously it's still an early prototype but Starhopper has uh, like zero heritage in any current starship design i would say i, I mean i could you know maybe i'm wrong but does that make sense like they actually have the heat shield on 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 their hopper which is an astounding engineering feat the way that they've been able to to work that into the design like the actively cooled heat shield so their hopper feels much more like i don't know sn5 or 6 i guess um or maybe yeah. even sn8 it's I think it's good I, I i really love the fact that um like you can like every time they talk about in public and they say like statements about their hardware you're like oh that makes sense like every time they are reasoning why they are doing things the way they're doing you're just like yeah of course uh and, and i think that's just a common theme i i have stoke and i also want to address something because people have after these engine pictures come up they were like oh it looks like they're they have so many parts looks like a way over complicated engines did you all forget the first pictures of raptor i was just it, thank yeah. you yeah i was it, thinking the same thing as we were looking at that picture it looks a lot like the early versions of Raptor, where there's just a whole bunch of extra tubing and instrumentation and all kinds of, I guess to use an aerospace term, doohickeys and whatchamacallits on there. That, uh, yeah, Raptor looked the exact same in the in the early days of Raptor. So ab absolutely yeah. looks fine to me. Looks great even. I kind of prefer that look in some ways. You forgot thingamabobs. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> never, forgot the... never judge... Never judge engine complexity, I think, by the first serial number. Judge engine complexity once they arrive like 50 or 100. Then we can talk about like how much has, has it developed over time. But the first one will always be overkill. Yeah, 100%. Oh. All Good shout, is, Adrian. All I have to say is one engine name, and then nothing else seems complicated. RS-25. <laughs> Not wrong. True. Not that wrong. same note. The engine doesn't have any name. What 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 name do you think they're gonna choose? Thanks for throwing us under the bus, Alex. Because now we have the basically the whole complex thing of the English language to pick for for this English language name. Well, that's my also, revenge for you know the the nasty questions that Jack always throws to me. Ooh. I don't throw you nasty questions. I throw you good questions. Also, when did um, you decide lies. you can just jump into NSF Live? Like how like how is this a thing now? You just decided this? It's been like a couple weeks in a row. You're just gonna you're just gonna ghostily I was given commentate. the power. 
Oh my god. <laughs> Why? Who did that? Was that Kevin? Of course. I will not divulge I... any uh proprietary secrets at NSF. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin, explain I... yourself. I'm thinking about a good uh, name right uh, now for the engine. Uh, uh, uh. What what do you got? I got nothing. That that's the worst. Like I I, I like the Astra naming scheme. Um, like I like just call it Engine One and Rocket One. Like that's that's it. about my creativity <laughs> in KSP. I hate it. My my sh my shuttle in KSP is literally called shuttle. Oh. Like that's where always, it stopped. I always just put curb on the front of anything. Like there's curb use. There's curb Polo. There's Curb Curie, you know. I mean, uh, everything uh, has to start at least with a K, but yeah. Right, right. I I get into very weird serial numbers always. It's like it's like airdrop vehicle one, and then it's one point one, and at some point I decided like this is now one point two, and then it's one point two point one. It's it's getting like like I never get to two. I never deem it worthy of two. Right, right. And I always do the thing where I'll have like six of those versions and I'll be like, which one was the good one that doesn't just run every time or spin out of control on ascent? Was that 1.2.1 underscore final final, this is the one? Or was it 1.2.3? <laughs> uh, Sounds like a daily now. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I guess you could call maybe the engines go with um, the fireplace engines. because Don't you have to stoke them to keep them going? Or the that's embers. That's pretty good. The embers. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Sawyer, you should be in comms. Uh, you want to lose another one? No, 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 no. <laughs> no Please no, no, don't. No, no, Please no, no, don't. No, 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 no. <laughs> Delete. <Goodbye. laughs> Delete. <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin, Lindsay, thank you for the support. They say, I'm loving the chill, funny, laid-back vibes of tonight's stream. My favorite Friday night NSF live so far. Thanks for all you do. Thanks, Caitlin. We appreciate it. And Ironclad, thank you for gifting five Red Team memberships. You're quite awesome. Be sure to thank Ironclad if you got a membership from them. Where even were we? I don't have a name for the engine. Something with an S. I feel like it needs to be something with an S to like have alliteration. But I'm not married to that. I, I think Sawyer kind of you took the cake there. Ooh, I like cake. You think it really beats <laughs> engine one? Um, hmm. Maybe I don't. Know. Yes. I yeah. It kicks its butt. Sorry, Adrian. Um. Let's see. All right. Let's move right along. I'm gonna get to talk about hilarious dawn news, which is so exciting, so awesome. The Polaris Dawn capsule is in this picture. It's way back there behind all the people. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's, it's really cool. I always love these team shots where you get to see everybody that, that has worked on, uh, on some hardware on a mission. So, yeah, they're getting ready to launch Polaris Dawn, still holding for later this year. And, of course, the big news about Polaris Dawn is that it will be the first EVA using a Dragon capsule and the first EVA conducted by like a private um organization it's not you know a government or nasa or something like that doing an eva with a crew it is a completely private crew because of course jared isaacman has set this whole thing up so yeah i mean i'm extremely excited to see this mission happen inspiration 4 was so amazing in and of itself and polaris dawn is in my opinion going to be even cooler um and I can't wait to see the furtherance of human knowledge with another, you know, milestone in the commercialization of, pay of space under humanity's belt. So I'm really excited for it, but I don't have to keep flapping my gums. Adrian, what do you, what are your, just, what do you think? I, I love it. Like, I think it's hard. Like, who, who doesn't love Polaris and the like, whole Polaris program and in general, Jared Isaacman's effort to make all of these private, uh, privately funded spaceflight projects reality. I think it's it's super cool. Um, I think Inspiration Four already was 
just an amazing mission. I'm looking forward to see all the other things that that Isaac Man has in the future. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, it's one of these missions that I, I, mean, I mean, I will for sure be nervous. Like there, there are very few missions at this point where I get a bit nervous, but I think Polaris Dawn will be one of these missions where I will be at least a bit like, um, not nervous is like a harsh word, but you know what I mean, right? Like, I think it's, a it's this, this, these, these things that are just new and, um, uh, that are, um, that that you're cautious about and want to see first, and I'm looking forward to see that. I'm sure, like I mean, there's hardly any company that you could judge that is, has more experience at this point in this field than SpaceX and Flying Crew. Uh, as of late, they're kind of good at that, <laughs> so uh, I'm sure they will they will test it properly and they will see it amazingly. But Sawyer, what's what's your thought on this? What how do you feel about Lars Dorn? There are two things that I really am interested in seeing in particular on this mission. And again, of course, they put the capsule all the way in the back. Yes, it's great. The people are very nice. But I want to see the capsule, first off, what modifications they made to the top part of it where, you know, the crew will actually egress for the EVA. Uh, I know they said they were going to be adding handles, but, you know, how many, where? Uh, and then, of course, the EVA suits as well. We've seen what they wear, you know, for launch and landing, but that's also being custom designed at SpaceX and Hawthorne. So that'll be another cool reveal once we finally get to that. Plus, when I was on my Astro Access Zero G flight, uh, one of the people that was helping us out was Sarah Gillis, who is going to be flying on it. So I'm also really excited to see her fly as well. Yeah, I, um, honestly, it's... It, it... I don't know what they are they are doing about this missions, but they just feel more connected and relatable to me. That's that's how I felt already like about Inspiration Four. Like they made it really, I, I don't want to say human because that takes away with, but like, but these these they're these NASA crews with these NASA astronauts, they're like, they're they're like, I don't feel I feel like they're so far away from me. Like they're they're like, I don't know. It, it's hard to explain, but with these uh, Jared Isaacman missions to give them like an overall name uh they they feel like very close to the to the audience or like to the spectators and uh that's what i what i love about them and um i'm i'm, I'm on board for it i i just want to i just want to see this and uh i mean it's it's cool that they are pushing a company like i, I don't I, f I feel like this capability of dragon in-flight evas that would have never been developed from by spacex if it would need not be for this mission, that's just because they decided they want to do this miss mission, or like Jared Isaacman decided to want to do this mission. That's why this capability now is being developed. That's super cool. That's that's a capability of a of a very major space company that was just developed for a private space flight. That's, I mean, go back fifteen years. That's kind of crazy. It's amazing. It really is, and and it's just another part of the puzzle where. We want to see the commercialization of space open up. Exactly. It yeah. opens up so many new doors in general, just with, because, you know, obviously, like you mentioned, we had the Inspiration 4 mission, which was a great start. Now you've got the Polaris Dawn, and, you know, I'm sure there's plenty more plans down the line with the Polaris program. There's also the discussion of, you know, saving Hubble uh, potentially along those lines. Obviously, it's still have to work some things out with NASA there, but I, I mean, this is the next step in the commercialization and the expansion of space, which I've always kind of been the advocate of, you know, NASA can go out and do the deep space exploration to start, and then, you know, the private companies come in afterwards. Obviously, you get the private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and things that work with NASA and ESA and so on. But, you know, now is the chance to really thrive and see what we can actually do in low Earth orbit. Yeah. Absolutely. It's... And and all of this tracks with other technologies as they've been in a certain phase of their development. I mean, cars were a certain way, planes were a certain way, and now we're seeing spaceflight. Sort of, you know, I, I just always think back to the early days of aviation, where it's like if you were adventurous and you had the means, you were going to get a plane and and you know, try and do things that had never been done before in the name of furthering our knowledge and, and continuing the development of this technology. And um, I'm so here for it for space flight. I'm so here for it. 
Meanwhile, on the ISS, Soyuz is departing. They just closed the hatch, and uh, we have this feed from NASA TV here. So, another crew getting ready to come home back to Earth. Yeah, there are three people in that right now. It's still going to be undocking in about an hour and a half from now, so there's still some time. But, you know, uh, they'll be on their way home, at least, and make it down to the steppes of Kazakhstan. Nice. Cool deal. So much going on. Yeah. Um, let me see if we have some Polaris Dawn questions. By the way, I do want to Jay point out just... I should probably mention the crew includes um, NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara, Russian cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky, and uh, Belarusian spaceflight participant Marina Vasilovskaya, I believe is the pronunciation. Oh my gosh, can we talk about her for a second? I, I saw some of the imagery when she arrived on station, and talking about um, you know Jared Isaacman and the Polaris Dawn missions, getting us excited because we're clo we feel closer to the, that type of person than say like a full fledged NASA astronaut. Seeing her reaction of getting onto the station was. I, I don't know. I loved it. She was just seemed so excited and so floored. And everyone was like, you know, joking around and being happy. And um, yeah, I, I, I appreciated I appreciated that a lot. Anyways, let's see if we've got some uh, some Polaris questions. Um, so quickly, like uh, before you go deep, move deeply into questions, I think at, at this point, it's also interesting, like where will Jared Isaacman stop? Right. Because um, I, he has obviously shown a commitment to do groundbreaking uh, missions, like missions that are doing things that right now um, others maybe wouldn't do, like, for example, NASA, maybe. Um, so, like, wh where does he stop? Will he, will Jared Isaacman at some point be on the moon, for example? Like, will, will he at some point decide to also do that? Like, the first private moon surface mission? Will he go to mars <laughs> like i i think really with him it's at we are at this point where we're like where is he stopping yeah i mean if, if you told me jared isaacman is the first human on on mars i'd be like yeah i believe it <laughs> it's uh, it's in the cards it's not like it's not is it the likeliest option i would not say he's the likeliest option right now no. but is he somehow in this deck of cards of who might be it for some reason yes Absolutely. I would, uh, that's a great way to put it. Like, it doesn't seem like it's even most likely or even remotely likely, but it's not impossible, which is just crazy to think about. Always one-upping himself. Yeah. You gotta, like you he, gotta love it. He has, I feel like he has, like, just this tendency, like, to, to just, like, always be like, and now watch this. And <laughs> Can we take a second yeah. to appreciate Snap's uh, composition here with the blue light and the orange light? Like, uh Mixing color temperatures is often tricky, but this is just right. Fantastic work from John Krause there. I assume. I, I assume these are his. I would think, maybe. Let's see here. Daniel Weilert is asking, do you think that they will eventually let Polaris Dawn mission to repair the Hubble? Do you think NASA will allow a Polaris Dawn mission to repair the Hubble? Because it's something that's been talked about. It's something that's been studied even. but. Uh, you know, bureaucracy, government organizations, safety, and it's, it, when you're in a large organization like that, it's very easy to say no um, to protect your job and the status quo versus saying yes to innovative new ideas, but I mean, it's been studied. Adrian, what do you think? Well, it's not going to be Polaris Dawn, because Polaris Dawn, uh, Dawn is like mission one. That's the name of the mission that will be do this whole uh, um spacewalk on a on a private capsule it's probably not going to be that one because we like i think it's too close to see this major mission modification at this point um but they are conducting a feasibility study study with together with nasa they are looking into it um honestly at this point it would it would just be like on the list of like things that i think is cool about jared isaacman uh, reboosting reboosting hubble it's it's probably somewhere on the list and uh, I don't think if NASA, like, 
if, if it comes to the point where it's either letting Hubble fall down or reboosting it using a private mission, I don't think NASA has that much to lose in the scenario. Because, um, I mean, if you get more time and even like, even if try it, even get the study of like, was this possible? Like that whole mission alone is worth trying. Even if you get to a scenario where Hubble after that is no longer usable, it's an interesting case study of can this program and can this kind of approach be used to maintain and reboost spacecrafts in orbit? The way I see it is I could, I mean, it would be a great demonstration to be able to do that and a great example of, hey, look, you know, if we've got common connectors, common parts, let's just be able to boost it and keep the science going. But at the same time, you know, Hubble's old. It's, <laughs> it's older than me, and I'm in my 30s now, so it's old. But <laughs> uh, it's still working. That's the important thing. After that uh, STS-125 repair mission in 09, it's still going strong. So I don't think NASA would want to risk anything with it, uh, with a private crew or anything like that, until it's really on its last legs and they decide, all right, you know what? Hubble's nearing the end. We're going to start shutting down a bunch of the instruments. Then maybe they would consider either testing it or I know there's a lot of people who've been saying, oh, use Starship to bring it back down. I could see feasibility studies happening then. But right now, with everything functioning well, I, for the most part, I don't see NASA allowing anyone touching Hubble. That's fair. I should throw ESA under the bus, too. It's both of them. I, I love how you're like, Hubble is old. It's old. It's old. I'm older than Hubble. So thanks. Thanks for you're that. You're welcome, Jack. That totally what, wasn't intentional. No, that was, that uh -huh. was an accident. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. That's, it's a really good question from Daniel, though. Um, yeah. But yeah, also, I'm, I'm old. Um, Mighty Unlikely is asking if the Polaris Dawn mission has any objectives that don't work out, not deadly, but just not possible because space is hard. Do they have to submit a mishap report with the FAA? Yes. Um, Great answer. There's a very high, <laughs> so, I mean, so the mishap investigation criteria, there are four, six, eight, nine criteria that trigger a mishap investigation. One, if one of them, one of them triggers, and you have to conduct a mishap investigation, and anything that is considered like more than just one would be. Although now thinking about it, is is so it depends where it happens in the mission, right? Because like a dragon in orbit, would that fall onto the FAA? No, but like during launch, yes. Uh, I think like anything in orbit would probably maybe not trigger something on a mishap because it's it's in orbit. I don't think that triggers a mishap. No, no, I think about it. Sawyer, what do you think? What was the question again? Sorry. I had the train going by. Oh, no worries. Uh, if something happens, like they're not f able to fulfill one of their objectives on a Polaris Dawn mission, does that uh, trigger a mishap investigation? I think it depends on what we're talking about objective-wise. I mean, if it's obviously something vehicle critical, then yeah. Like, say you, you know, there's an issue with the hatch getting stuck or something like that, which... It happened on a shuttle mission. There was one where they went into the airlock, went to try and open it, and it got completely stuck. And they basically had to come back early and fly the mission again because of a stuck door. Uh, you know, something like that, maybe. Obviously, vehicle performance would be an important one. But if it's just, you know, uh, we were going to do this demonstration while we were outside doing the EVA or, you know, something they were monitoring on the IVA inside the vehicle was different then maybe I, you know, if they would just let it go. Yeah, and just to just to point this out, uh, it would really also happen when it happens, because just to quote the mishap response program here that the FAA has uh, on the website, the FAA is responsible for protecting the public during commercial space transportation, launch and re-entry operations. So uh, this, like, I, I don't think, for example, like missing, as Alex also said, like missing the spacewalk, for example, or like not conducting the spacewalk, that would not trigger a mishap. That's not, that's, that's not the FAA's guidance. Anything that happens during launch and re-entry that is in any way uh, triggering one of these nine criteria, that would come instantly trigger a mishap investigation. That's the segments that the FAA governs. But 
other side here, if something of normal happens in the in the spaceflight part, and for example, they cannot conduct their spacewalk, yes, that would still trigger some investigation, just not the FAA. But for example, SpaceX would very much look into that. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Hypnotics asking, what exactly will they do during the EVA on Polaris Dawn? Do we have any word on that? I don't think there's a lot of info yet on that. Uh, I haven't seen much. Again, I know they have the handles mounted outside for them to grasp onto. Otherwise, I think it's kind of a lot of testing and finding out. Yeah, that I makes sense. Sorry, I don't I have a better answer. The they're, they're pretty quiet with a lot of this stuff. I think conducting the space fog itself is already such an, like achievement right. and everything like that's basically the main part of the goal they have also talked about science some scientific goals of this mission but they are not only um related to the spacewalk but i think the main part is actually conducting the spacewalk that's still something that that you first have to prove so i think um that's that's the primary goal yeah that makes sense makes a lot of sense uh, and Daniel is saying it would be great to have the Starship return Hubble to the Smithsonian at the end of its life, wouldn't it? Would can you imagine going to see that incredible piece of hardware and like getting up close to it and looking at its weathered exterior? Is weathered? I don't know. Uh, I guess well, there's space weather, sure. Yeah, technically. I mean, they have, I believe, the wide field camera already there on display. They've got. Some of the instruments from it, but that whole thing hanging there, that would be just nuts. Yeah, I, I hope that's something that we get to see in our lifetimes. And I also hope that in the process of that happening, we get a newer, better optical space telescope in the visual wavelength area. You know, a Hubble replacement. Right. Like, I, love which... me some, I love me some James Webb and all, don't get me wrong, but. Uh, a true Hubble successor is what I'm here for. I was going to say, you know James what? Webb is not, to be clear. Uh, I know that's like uh, the next Hubble is what they're calling it, but it, like you were talking about, it does a lot of things in the infrared and x-ray spectrums as opposed to, uh, or excuse me, infrared spectrums as opposed to visible light, which is what we're kind of used to seeing with Hubble. Yeah, which is good for a variety of, of different reasons. So I love James Webb, don't get me wrong, but I also want a direct Hubble successor. Alex is saying Roman Roman in our back channel. Roman will be nuts, that's true. Roman is going to be nuts. But Roman is also uh, infrared, right? Hubble was oh, also oh. infrared, so Hubble uh, oh, we was able to see, well, is able to see, as you say, in optical, uh, near infrared and uh, ultraviolet light. I think Roman will only do optical and, and near infrared, but we have other instruments that we can, that you know we can use for ultraviolet. The thing that I'm excited about Roman, even though it is the same capabilities in terms of the size and everything as Hubble. It'll be able to to see more of the sky at a time, which means we'll be, we we will be able to have detailed shots of a lot more of the sky. Um, I wrote about the Euclid telescope, which was launched uh, in July by by uh, by Falcon Nine. That is smaller than Roman. It can see one third of the sky in essentially five years. That same amount of the sky, it will take Hubble hundreds of years to see. Roman will also be able to see that third of the sky in about five, six years. So it'll be bonkers to have that kind of image quality on such a huge amount of the sky. Anyways, I'm already done with with my, I don't know, I'm, I'm just waiting for, for that thing to launch. And it's also going to launch on a Falcon rocket, but it's going to be a Falcon Heavy. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to shout out one other telescope here, which we are not like that much on focus on because it's a Chinese one. But I think we have to uh, mention Xuntian here, the uh, Chinese Space Station Telescope, CSST, uh, which will be able to tell uh, to get 2.5 gigapixel uh, images of 40 percent of the sky over 10 years, which is also a, a high capability. It's an, another like like deep field. Kind of telescope which will uh, complement the uh, 
uh, Tiangong Space Station. Um, but that's also launching somewhere in the next 2025 or so. Um, but uh, that's that's another telescope that is launching. I know it's Chinese. It's it's, uh, it's probably hard to get more data from that for over here. But it's still, I think, Suntian is a really cool project. Indeed. Yeah. Can I point something out really quick? Is it that Jake is absolutely assaulting you right now? No, it's East Coast, Best Coast, as SpaceX tweeted that they are now targeting uh, tomorrow for their Falcon, li Falcon 9 launch of 8-1 out on the West Coast due to unfavorable weather. Because, I mean, that's obviously the most important tweet that they put out right now. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm so mad at you. It's the truth. I'm so, they scrub. I'm so, I'm so mad at you, Sawyer. Uh, we do have some way better SpaceX tweets, though. Breaking news. SpaceX tweeted about the static fire. And uh, there's a drone video, is there not? Let's take a look. I haven't actually looked at these yet. Beautiful. Do it again. Do it again! I once again say it's six and a half. See, I see people saying eight. It's 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 hard because it starts to throttle down. So do you still count that? There's like a part where it's already throttling down. So I would say six and a half. Some people would say eight. I think it's hard to judge based on. I feel like in that clip, the, once the sound stops, is when it's when I would count it. Yeah, somebody somebody needs to do like a pixel count. There's a fight going on in the back channel over the over the t amount of time. There's no yeah. fight. Everyone just says eight. <laughs> well, that <laughs> is awesome. I am. You know what? I'm going to be kind of sad when we have different shaped orbital launch mounts because the star pattern of the of the flame is really freaking cool to see from the air from these drone shots. Like, just a massive burning asterisk in the into the ground <laughs> it's neat it's really cool some other cool designs yeah no doubt and i i am all for a design that involves less smoke and dust and everything being kicked up because then better photos what you mean actually being able to see the rocket when it takes off yes that would be nice you can see I, the I hole downstairs enjoy, like, look at that i i always enjoy with starship the how, how do you spot Starship lifting off? You look at the very tip that peaks over the cloud, and it's like, oh, tip is moving. That's like, that's the Starship launching indicator yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah, Alex, really good point. You can see the booster hold downs in the inner, like the inside of the mount because they're backlit by the flame like that. That is beautiful. Oh, wow. Really cool. That's fancy. Indeed. Also, it's such an inferno. Definitely an inferno. Disco inferno? Sure, why not? Oh, wow. Well, did, I don't see a SpaceX tweet saying successful 33 engine or anything like that. They just say getting ready for flight four. And uh, yeah, so not exactly confirmation that the test was full 33 engine static fire other than certainly seemed to be. But uh, who knows? Maybe we'll get some more tweets from Elon or something a little bit later tonight. But by all accounts, to just wrap a bow on everything and take it back to Booster 11, it seemed like a really smooth test today. It's exactly the kind of thing we want to see as they continue to ramp up this cadence. I got to say, it is nice to hear those engines purring again as we get closer to Flight 4. Nice. Nice work. Uh, Gunfox, thank you for the $25 tip to tips.nsspaceflight.com. We appreciate you so much, and for the earlier support as well. 
They say it would be very interesting to see Starship used to recover Apollo equipment and brought back for study and for display as well. But I would love to see, they said humble, but I bet they meant Hubble. Uh, I would love to see Hubble to be saved. Sadly, I think it will be allowed to burn up. Yeah, well, we can dream, right? And I'm going to be there with just... a giant baseball glove at Point Nemo. Yes. I, I kind of want to just add to the like telescope discussion we had earlier. Can we please find somehow a, a way to fund Luvor? Oh. Like, I want Luvor. Yes, uh, absolutely. I thought you were going to say Chandra. I was, I'm yeah, still I was I'm still mad about Chandra. Oh, man. yeah, okay. Like... Okay, to, to, I, I will add to this. Can we find funding to keep Chandra first? Higher priority because it's already like like it's already there. Let's let's keep using it. Can we also find funding for Luvor? I know yes, I'm please. asking a lot here. Like I'm, but I, I want Luvor. For the people who don't know, it's the large ultraviolet optical infrared surveyor, which is a proposed uh, design of a telescope, which is massive. It's like basically a huge James Webb like telescope, but like ultraviolet and it's crazy. And uh, I would love yeah, to see. Yeah, it's like it. I would. It's like James Webb Max Plus, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh God, it's no absolutely... more subscription services. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you like more astro imagery? It's twenty five dollars a month. <laughs> Imagine if you have to include a bit more RAM, though. That's going to be expensive. Well, you can just always, it. That's how they get you. They get you with the RAM. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, Luvor would be. Uh, there's Good different bad. versions of it, by the way. I should add, there's like a like a six meter aperture version, and there's there the, and uh, to be fair, this is there's, I think there's A with an, a fifteen meter mirror, and then there's B with an eight mirror m meter mirror. So, and for context, James Webb has a six point five meter mirror. So, um, there's there's different concepts about this. There's A and B, by the way. Um, it's such a cool concept, but it would cost like. Uh, a lot. <laughs> um, All the money. Based on, yeah, it's it's yeah. It's a huge would be a huge endeavor, and it would not be ready to launch before like twenty forty or so. Uh, even if funded today, it would take forever. Um, but again, it's that's the thing with space telescopes; they take forever. So we need to think about funding stuff now to get them ready in the future. You cannot wait until twenty thirty five to fund something cool if you. You, if you want it in 2035, you need to fund, fund it today. Yeah, then you have basically like a generational gap in between improvements, like marked improvements in in uh, the science that we're able to do. And it's like, you can't, you just can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You can't do that. Anyways, before we get too political, <laughs> good shout, Adrian. That was, I, I do agree. I want Lavore. Um, I want all of, I want all the science, more science, more better. But I think with that, we will uh, begin to wrap things up here. Definitely want to thank all of our members, our members. <laughs> we love you. And especially we want to thank our launch directors and flight engineers. We could not do what we do without all y'all. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's really loud, Kevin. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was faded in to knock us yeah, out. Yeah, it is faded in. Um, <laughs> for real, thank you so much to all of our members, especially our launch directors and flight engineers. Y'all are the best. The Bedrock Foundation on which we all exist here at NSF. Also, Jim Cavett gifted a Red Team membership a minute ago, so I want to hit that as well. Oh, Sawyer, thanks for being on, good buddy. Oh, uh, it's always great to be on, and... Um... I think Jake says it was great to be on too, but his eyes are closed, so he may just be saying, I'm sleeping. No, oh, he's a sleepy buddy. Yeah, he's a sleepy buddy. Adrian, thank you as well for being on. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed this one. It's, uh, I cannot believe this was two hours. Like, this, this flew by. So, yeah, I could, uh, really enjoyed I could this conversation. We had that booster static fire stream earlier, and I could I could probably go another hour here easy. But the road is open, and I need to go get cameras off the places where the cameras are. <laughs> so we've got to go. Um, I'm Jack Byer. Oh, oh. Also, we had uh, Kevin in the background running today's stream. Thank you to Kevin for running in the giant hamster wheel that makes things go. All right. Well, is that? 
There's more Is good stuff coming. End? Keep in mind, I'm sure we'll be able to see some of those on your socials and the NSF social media channels, right, Jack? Yes, w that's a good point. Watch Twiz. Yes. Watch Twiz. Watch the flyover. Watch the, watch the booster static fire replay video. Watch the daily videos. Hit the like button. Hit the bell. Subscribe. Follow us on Facebook. X tell your, Twitter. Tell your friends yep, about now us. Now it's getting louder. <laughs> Annoy your family by talking about us until they can't Send hear the anything pigeon. else. Send carrier pigeons. You learn Morse code and telegraph flags. Like a <laughs> semaphore. <laughs>